Hey everybody, welcome back. Well, a lot to go over. We have to talk about small caps, big caps, tech, semis, and what's going on, frankly, in the presidential race, which I'd rather not talk about, but we do need to cover it. If we take a look here, we got a real clear shot of just the open and high, low, doesn't really matter. I mean, the entire bar, we have no shade whatsoever, and we stopped right here at the 12. This is an issue because there was no reprieve, and it didn't matter where you went. Now, I thought there might be a little reprieve later in the day, and we just didn't get that. And what we should really pay attention to is right here at 12, and then you just see the drop, and then it was just, it was incessant. So, and let me show you what I mean by that. So what we have is you have these peaks right here, and where you're trying to hold, let me flip this to this level right here. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to hold on these peaks, these lower peaks, and you're just not able to do it. And then what happens is you finally crack them. Now, once that happens, it, you're pretty much stuck. And you can see that right in here. And then you try to rally over that and you're just not able to do anything like that. And this really becomes the issue. So once you drill into that, you start looking at it. Oh, we're gonna flip over, nope. And then we break it again. And then you look at this level. Now, this is where it gets super interesting. To me, it did anyway, because you have this level right here at that one o'clock time. This is when you had the 20 year bond auction. If anybody follows me, they know how much I like the stool and talk about macro and why you need to watch macro. So we did stop here. So now if we clean all this off for a second, and if we just focused on the basics and said, okay, that marks the low, then we undercut that, and then we rallied. Yes and no, but we were unable to really get anywhere. And I think it's just utter lack of demand, quite frankly. You don't have the buybacks right now till, till I think it's July 29th, the buybacks start. So then we would look at this and go, okay, well, what else can we surmise from this? And let's take a step back. And we can see that we're in that same exact area we were when, right after CPI came out. So that's our level. And for whatever reason, that is the level that people are comfortable with. So what does that mean? Well, we were here in the, what, eighth held rally. We felt like heroes. We got some data. We didn't feel like heroes anymore. We dropped down, we rallied, and now we're sitting there again. So I think it's very safe to say that this is an extremely important level, and it's definitely one that I would watch. Now, they stepped us up over and over and over again, only to what? Just reject. And then, of course, you take the stairs up and you take what? The window down. So this is the level that we have to pay attention to. Watch this on a four hour chart and you can see the rally up. And I, I always find this really important. So what we're gonna do is look at it this way. You're gonna mark the low of that bar. I call these control bars. And then you're gonna mark the high of that bar. And what you're gonna see here is over rejected, over rejected, over, then we got a doji, and then you get the confirm of the doji, and then that was really it, and then you're right back down again. So I think it's safe to say that this is your range and that this bar is in control. And when I do that, what it does is it allows me to know that from my perspective, sellers are still in control. Now, before we get into all this data, and I have a lot of data, and I did see some things today in my mind that were troubling. It just shouldn't, some things shouldn't have happened the way that they did. It doesn't really matter what I think, it only really matters what happens. But if I take a look at this, and this is one of the levels we talked about today in the pre-market, for those that watch that pre-market public live, and you can see that once you break that, these start becoming the targets. And that's a long way down, frankly. And we're seeing some of this turning up here, right? I don't like when you take up over and then they break you back down. And you did that in a lot of trades today. It doesn't even matter the time frame, but when there's no follow through or consolidation and then decision, that's just being what I refer to as just mean. And they're really just doing it on purpose because they know it's going to lure people in. I can give you a great example of this in a five minute chart. It looked today like this was going to go. So you have this beautiful flag off the open, doji inside bar, doji inside bar. And this is why context, macro, and fundamentals is so important. Because you would look at this and go, oh, well, clearly we're going to go higher and we're going to gap fill as always. Everybody loves Lily. And then what does it do? Once you broke there, and then it's set up again only to break later in the day. That's not normal. So why are they doing that? And what was even more troubling to me is this had nothing to do with any of the news. So this is partial news where Trump says that Taiwan should pay the U.S. for its defense and doesn't give us anything. Um, this is paraphrasing, but it was pretty much this bad, actually, for, for really nothing left to do but just kind of laugh at it. But yeah, I mean, basically coming out and saying, you know, why are we intervening in this? And I think that we're going to see more of this domestic kind of talk. 
uh, not only from here, but rhetoric all over the globe. I think you're going to see way more you know, worry about us from nations than we've seen in the past. It seems to be going that way. Uh, I'm not going to get into whether it's good or bad. I'm just going to tell you it is what it is. I, this is obviously an issue in regards to Taiwan. But really, I think this had less to do with the move. I think this was an exacerbation of the move. But he's not going to cost trillions of dollars to come out of the market. Now, I would equate it to a, a myriad of factors. I'm not saying that that didn't anticipate it, of course. But ASML stock saw the steepest decline on Wednesday, falling more than 12% shares of the company. Basically, they beat, but they have this number called bookings. And it's supposed to come in closer to $6 billion. They're equating it to that it was 50 to 51, and they're expecting 51.5 on the gross margins. I think it was more that the bookings, the estimate, the whisper number was 6 billion and they came in at 5.6, but it obviously doesn't help if gross margins are light. You're talking about basis points. So I, I don't know. I think they're going on a stretch there. I think it had more to do with the bookings. Rumor was anything under five and a half, it would sell down pretty hard. It came in at 5.6. So it looks like they sold it down anyway. Uh, also, for some reason, this is really getting glanced over, and I'm not sure why. Uh, chip stocks, Taiwan Semi Manufacturing, ASML have all soared thanks to investor. On Wednesday, their momentum came to a screeching halt. Three stocks slid for a reason. One headwind that emerged is tighter restrictions on semiconductor technology to China. So Bloomberg issued a report this morning that the administration is considering implementing more severe curbs involving foreign manufacturing products at even the smallest amount of American technology. The problem that with this has been with the administration is you just don't know what they're going to do next. And what's happening is you'll see that NVIDIA recently came out and said that they have a new chip. And this is where it gets really interesting because it's like a cat and mouse game. NVIDIA invests money to come up with a new chip. You can see this on July 8th. NVIDIA designed specific chips supposed to generate billions of dollars. And then what do they do? Well, they change. Now you can't have any technology or, or we don't know what it is. And we'll let you know. And so this is becoming a real issue. They're not giving very specific guidelines. What someone's saying about one thing versus another, and I'm not saying that, you know, that the current forerunner coming out and saying, you know, we want money or we're not going to defend you, essentially extorting a country, is probably not the way to go with foreign policy. But without getting into that, the current administration sitting there and going, hey, yeah, I know we told you that these were the rules, but now these are the rules. Oh, you figured out a way around those rules? Oh, these are the rules. Oh, you got around that? These are now the new rules. So if that's going to be your point, it's real simple. Forget sanctions. Just say we're banning it. And instead of them doing that and being that definitive, they're not doing that. So this is really where I think the uncertainty is coming from. And I think that this is going to be a larger problem for the, for the entire sector uh, than most people think. Now, it'll be easier for me to explain it this way more than anything else. So this is how we're, I'll do it. Let me just clean off this drawing. So this is Taiwan Semi, and I'm, I'll just walk you through what I mean by this so that you can follow along. Let me just clean that off for a second. So what I'm going to get at is just a couple things here. Okay, first, NVIDIA. NVIDIA makes a chip. That chip that they're making, they're not going to go spend billions of dollars to make a chip and go to Taiwan Semi and say, make a chip. Taiwan Semi is not going to go and buy the equipment from ASML, okay, if they don't know that they're going to get that order from NVIDIA, okay, then that means that LAM Research, AMAT, KLAC, all the equipment manufacturers are not going to then sell their products to build up the capacity utilization of Taiwan Semi, which then all this stuff feeds upon itself. None of this is going to exist if you don't know that you can sell your product. You're not going to go try and sell a product for billions of dollars and then be told that you can't sell that one. That doesn't mean they don't come to a solution, but it does put uncertainty around when you're going to be able to sell that. And I would argue that this is more the reason for the sell down in semiconductors than anything today. The market hates uncertainty. If you thought that it was just going to be, oh, well, Taiwan Semi, whatever happens to Taiwan happens, that that's one thing. And I'm not saying that it didn't hurt the market. Of course it did. But the uncertainty of, well, you can go and create that, but maybe it's going to be an issue. Maybe it's not. You're not going to go and spend that money till you get certainty. And if you're going through one administration and you realize that you might be dealing with another administration, you might push out your orders. You know, the one thing that we keep hearing about on these ASML calls is pushing out orders, pushing out orders. And you keep trying to figure out, well, if you have demand, why are you pushing it out? So when I try to figure things out, I, I get up early in the morning, people that are in the community know this, but 
I get up like super early and I read every piece of research I can get my hands on and I get my access, I have access to a lot of research. And one of the things that I did was I went back and I reread Goldman's piece today because I'm trying to figure out what's, what's the issue. And so this stuck out to me and I'll share it with you and then you guys can put your comments on what you think about this. As such, ASML reiterated its prior 2024 guidance roughly flat year over year sales. My problem with this statement, what I'm trying to wrap my noodle around is why are we flat year over year if Taiwan Semi keeps saying that they're going to ramp up and double by the end of 24, their fiscal year 24, and then they're going to double again in 25. Now listen to this part. Ahead of what it believes will be significant growth in 25, supported by new fab openings, strong secular trends such as AI, governmental initiatives such as the U.S. CHIP Act, and an industry upturn. Okay, so governmental initiatives such as, so it's not just, if, if you read between the lines, they're not just saying the U.S. CHIPS Act. So they don't need all this unless they think there's going to be other government initiatives, right? You would just say the U.S. CHIPS Act. Or they think that the government and the initiatives of the government might lead to more demand. So that stuck out to me. And then there's this little bit in it as well. Forget about the transistor. They're talking about one of the new products. The company stated it will revisit 2025 and 2030 targets in its November CMD, given the need to prepare to supply new factories of customers in the world. Now, I'm just going to read it again. The company stated it will revisit 2025 earnings guidance and 2030 targets in its November CMD, given the need to prepare to supply new factories of customers in the world. We believe investors will look for further color on the call as to which customer types are ordering the tools and what order flow can be expected later in the year. And they, Goldman reiterates their buy. What I think is fascinating is they're talking about these initiatives and they're talking about the drivers and they're talking about all this growth. And then they're talking about it in November. Well, what happens in November? We have elections in November. So what I think that everybody's doing here is trying to get more certainty on what they're going to be dealing with with the next four years. Are they going to have to deal with these levels of restrictions or do they come into a new administration where there's less restrictions and we know that there's going to be less deregulation? We already know that. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. We're talking monetary and fiscal policy here. And I think that there's a very important distinction. So it seems to me that they're kicking the can down the line. And that's great down the line, but we still have to get through tomorrow. I am interested on your comments on that and what you think, but it just seems to me that that's starting to make a lot more sense to me that that's what they're doing, that they're looking at this and saying, okay, you know, what's the big game plan here? How are we going to handle this? Tonight, you're going to have late night, you're going to have Taiwan Semi's uh, earnings release. It better be amazing. And quite frankly, you, you have this island reversal gap here with this gap here and here. And already, it's got to be something because now we're below the 22 and a retest of the 55 would not be surprising. Tomorrow night, you have Netflix. And I have, some, I have a bunch of other data I really want to go over with you so that you're prepped for tomorrow. And I want to show you the things that concern me. And then I'm going to show you some data, but I'm going to go over the data in greater detail on Saturday. But if you take a look at Netflix here, for example, and we look at how this is going, one of the core things that I would look at is we're holding right here, but you have earnings tomorrow. We need to watch that. Now, the other larger concern that I had with today was this, and we'll get, we'll get into this and I'll show you this reversal. Now, I'm not saying that you can't reverse. This is one of the most forceful moves that you've ever had in RTY in such a short period of time. I mean, it's, it's really vicious how strong it was, not the move or percentage over time, but just how vicious it was in this period of time. I'm going to show that in a second with data. What bothered me was this. Now, every day in the community, I, I trade live and then I show what I'm doing. And then I walk through the trades while I'm doing that. Either John or Apex will type out what's actually happening uh, so that we have a written record of it. I, I keep all the live streams. None of them are deleted going back years and, I, and none of this is ever deleted. But to show the timestamp, so our game plan was to understand that everything that was going on with tech, semiconductors, none of that is really affecting the bond market, correct? And none of that is really affecting why regionals are going higher. None of that's going to affect why industrials are going higher. None of it's going to affect why biotech's going higher or home builders are going higher. Okay, so what, what I start doing is I start buying DPST, I start buying more of it, and then I start looking at LABU, and I know that that's next. And then I start looking at the home builders. And the home builders failed like almost immediately and I just kicked it. 
But these trades worked and they worked exceptionally well. Now watch what happened to them. And just for point of reference, so you can see the timestamps already on where they're at, but LABU trimmed, CAT resistance, LABU trimmed, DPST, and you can see I'm just out, out. UPST we bought more of, KBH. I'm just blowing them out. And why am I doing that at 9.51? Here, watch. So DPST, I had my level marked off on where the high was. Now, if I just drop this, and this is gonna to have to stay unedited because I don't have the time. I have to listen to a couple of conference calls tonight. But if you if you look at this 107 right here, okay, and I'm marking off that level. Let me show you what I'm marking off right here so you can see that right there. So I'm gonna go look at this five minute bar. And what I'm marking off is this bar on that push was less than 50%. So this bar's push was less than 50%. And once I saw that, we were already trimming into this as you just saw. I'm like, okay, I have a problem. In other words, it's stopping. So what I will do on these push bars, I sell into them for positive slippage. And then when I get something like this, that's giving me a demarcation line. That's telling me point blank. And I'll show the live trade this week if there's interest in how, how to do this. But that's telling me that wicks are price rejection. And if 50% of that bar is a wick, then that bar is really negative, even though it's green. So if you come here and look at that, you'll note that that 50% line, that marked the high of the day on DPST. So something as simplistic as that, you'll be surprised how easy that can help you. But into this, we're selling. Now, if you look at how that closed, you'd be like, oh, well, that's a great close. Okay, watch this with LABU. What did we do here? We bought in here, right? You saw the timestamps and then we got out, right? In here, okay, why? Look at how we failed at the gap close. Right at the previous day, that's why I always tell people to mark off the, the open, the high, the closes. Look at this and how you failed right here. And then it was just straight down all day. So if that theme was going to hold today, I'm not saying the theme's dead, I'm gonna show you some data on it. But if that theme was going to continue today, it's not rejecting here. It's going to continue here, it's gonna go sideways is sure as heck, for lack of a better term, is not doing this, right? We would all know that, okay? We all know that this is not good. This does not make you feel warm and fuzzy if you own something like that. And that's one of the reasons even yesterday, people say, well, didn't you sell more yesterday? Yeah, because I had this going on. And this is one of the reasons why I'll always trim, I will always trim 3X ETFs, always into a third standard deviation, like always I will tr trim right into them. No matter where I am, it's just, it's silly to not trim something into those, but especially when they're this wide, there's a differentiating factor there, but I, I don't wanna go off on too many tangents because there's still so much to go over so that you're prepped for tomorrow. Because once you see some of these other charts, I think you're gonna say, huh, for lack of a better term. If you say, huh, you can put that in the comments. But you see, like you can see the issue, right? But you see that rejection? Okay, then you go to the home builders. And yeah, we blew out some of the home builders. Yeah, they're tired. Yes, it's a huge move. But this was a big, big shift. So you start looking at KBH, and this is the stuff you have to watch. The higher highs and then the rejections. And you, again, you can go back and look at the timestamps because it's all there. But what they did was this. They flipped you over, right? They made you feel warm and fuzzy. Oh, come on in. The water's fine. No, no, we're really going to hit new highs. And then they just pull the, the rug, they complete Matumbo, and then you're down. And now look at the end of the day. Watch this with nail, and then you'll see how fast I got out of the trade. You know, it's funny, in the room, they always say to me, like, gosh, you get out so fast. I, show me where I'm getting out, and then it goes against me, right? Or goes higher. There's no reason to be in this stuff. We're in a 130 and change. Maybe I got 75 cents out of it for a minute before they pulled the rug, and I just, I got right out of the way. And a lot of this stuff today, if you notice from your trading, you were fighting all day. Even if you bought puts, unless you bought the right puts and like some of the consumer names, you were really fighting all day long. But the thin, the thin names, you're gonna have to watch because this can get this can get really, really ugly. You start looking at some of these names like ANF uh, and you start looking at like ELF. And we talked about ELF the other day, actually in the public pre-market at eight o'clock. We were talking about this, if you go back two days ago, and we were just talking about this megaphone and the rejection and how that was signaling that you were setting up one way or another. And since it rejected three times, we were thinking it'd break to the downside. I didn't do anything on the short side until today, candidly. But once you see this, you can't unsee it, right? I mean, you can't unsee that. You know, you're breaking the 55, it's straight down and it's straight selling. And there's no reprieve to it whatsoever. It doesn't matter what you look at, look for. It's just 45 degree angle straight selling. And if you watched any of these videos, straight 45 degree angle selling is what? Institutional. So my concern was this. My concern was I'm looking at this data and now they're selling even what I think they shouldn't be selling. 
Meaning you could say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. The rate of change right here is, this is the five date rate of change. And what it's showing is small cap versus large cap ratio. And if you look right here, we talked about how fast this was. If you, if you look at this, you would go, okay, well, I get that. I mean, this is going back to 26, guys. This is Sediment Trader. This isn't me. No affiliation with them. Zero. They put out a good product. That's all I'll say. It gives you really good data. What you do with the data is up to you. But you can see the mark right here. And then you go here and you go, okay, well, 86, 87. Okay, great. And then all this nonsense, right? Back here in the day. Back in the day. So you can see where we're at. And they're showing you what the historical shift is. Now, that shift five day, seven and a half percent. I only have three data points. Statistically speaking, I can't use three data points, but I did find this interesting. March 25th, 2020, October 19th, 87, Jan 4th, 1974. If you go back to 1950, this has only happened three times. So let's look at the first one, March. And then you can see right in here when that happened, it was actually on the 25th. And then of course we had one of the greatest bull markets in the world where the Fed injected $1.7 trillion in the market and we did nothing but go straight up and everybody thought they were a genius, right? And you can see that. Remember NFTs, they're gonna rule the world, all of that stuff. And you just see how we ripped over and over again. Okay, let's look at 87. So 87, the move actually happened on the crash. It was actually a crash when it happened in 87. Now that's kind of interesting because you could say, well, that was the crash and that's what we're setting up for. No, what we did from there is we ripped and we went higher, right? That's what happened here, okay? We fell apart and then we went higher. So the question is, are we gonna fall apart and then go higher? Just like we did over here, right? Like when we go back to the other one, and I don't have this all mapped out, so you're gonna just have to deal with the cuts and me doing this for lack of a better term, but is that what we're going to deal with? Are we going to deal with some kind of implosion, which is what just started today, and then we're going to do something like this? I don't have an answer, but let's take a look at 74, and then we can go from there. Now, 74 is a little different, and, and I'd like to go over this on Saturday if there's an interest, but 74 led to a 35% decrease. I only have three data points, which is not a lot, but I'm thinking of going over this on Saturday if there's interest, so let me know in the comments. I thought it was fascinating that these are not these are not small moves. These are massive moves when that happens. I don't think anyone would disagree that the bottom of the pandemic or dropping 38%, even though it doesn't look like it because we're so used to the S&P being so much higher. Um, and then what you saw with the great financial crisis in 87, Black Monday, like all of that. I mean, that they led to huge, massive moves, either up or down. So I think it warrants our time to look at. This was something I'm definitely going to go over on Saturday, but I wanted to show you this before tomorrow so that you can see this. We're in one of the most overbought market markets. Wow, that was bad. I need more coffee. Since 1920, minimum RSI across all time frames, above 70 on every single time frame, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly. Now, this is what was so neat today because you could see it. And I'll go, I am going to go over this. Look at healthcare when this happens. If you're overbought on every time frame going back to 1920, look at look at these numbers. Discretionary, which is falling off a cliff today. Okay, and it doesn't look like that is the norm, but okay. But look at healthcare. I mean, healthcare is outperforming tech. How, and it's going back to 1920. It's not going back a small time. And then it's the discretionary names. I thought that this was absolutely fascinating. And then if you go through here and just highlight that it's still growth, growth still led. We'll do more of this on Saturday. As always, your comments are greatly appreciated. It lets me know how to create content. That's it.